The Roman Empire was the mightiest empire on earth, one that had to maintain order amongst its people. Law and order, as some may say. Ancient Romans abscond from using death as a means to punish crimes unless they really had to. But when they did, they got absolutely methodical and creative in executing death sentences and made medieval punishments look like a walk in the park. Welcome to Nutty History, and let's find out what punishment was like in ancient Rome. The ancient Roman Empire was the center of the earth for almost a thousand years, and every road in the world led to Rome back then. At its height during the reign of Emperor Trajan, the Roman Empire ruled more than 45 million people spread across Europe, Asia, and Africa. But obviously, not all of these people were law-abiding. Some were rebels, some were corrupt, and some were outright criminals. In fact, with more than a million people residing in Rome, the city itself was a dirty and dangerous place, a maze of side streets and slums. Crime was a common occurrence on a daily basis, and Roman guards had to do a lot more than correct grammar of a graffiti drawing miscreant. Understand? Yes, sir. Now, right out under times. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Hail Caesar, sir. However, instead of an organized police force, Romans had vigils. These vigils were 7,000 strong and were charged with dealing with everyday crimes like theft and to capture and enslave people who might attempt to flee from justice. The Roman guards were only called if the matter would go beyond the capabilities of vigils, for example, in cases of riots, rebellion, or civil unrest. Meanwhile, matters of imperial interest and the emperor's security were in the hands of the Praetorian Guard. In theory, Roman laws were written in a manner to discourage people from committing crimes by making an example of the guilty party with the punishment. However, the reality was that people would get punished according to their status and wealth in Roman society. No wonder modern judiciary resembles ancient Rome law so much. Like most of the ancient law systems, Romans followed the principle of personality. That means the law was only applicable to Roman citizens. Foreigners, well, they had no rights and unless protected by some treaty between their state and Rome, they could be seized like ownerless pieces of property by any Roman. However, with time, diplomacy became more and more crucial for the Roman Empire. Therefore, the increasing commercial interests of Rome forced it to protect the foreigners by some decree of justice. This is why the Jus Civil or Civil Laws were replaced by a more flexible and applicable Jus Gentium, or the Law of Nations in 3rd century BC, protecting foreigners more or less like the civilians. The legal procedure established by Romans was the most crucial part of their judiciary, as it was the grandfather of the legal system that we use today. Roman goddess Justitia can attest to that as she has been standing in the majority of legal courts of justice for more than two millennia now. The legal procedure, or Liges Actionis, was a step-by-step -step process of detailed bureaucracy. First, the plaintiff approached the defendant in public and called for him to come to court. If he refused, he could be taken there by force. The trial itself was divided into two parts. The first was a preliminary hearing held before a magistrate who would decide whether there was an issue to be contested and, if so, what it was. Each step in this procedure was extremely formal. If the wrong words were used by either party, that party might lose the case. After the issues were delineated, both parties agreed upon a judex, who was neither a lawyer nor a magistrate but a prominent layman to try the case. The proceedings before the judex were more informal. Advocates spoke and gave evidence, and witnesses often appeared. The judex made a decision but had no power to execute it. If the defendant refused to pay the fine or make restitution within a certain period, he could be brought by force to the magistrate. Then his property could be seized, or he could be made a slave to the plaintiff to work off the debt or property claim. Later, as the cases became more and more complex, the magistrates were given more power over resolving the case themselves instead of sending it to a judex. Roman punishment actually varied depending on one's position in Roman society. A slave had no rights whatsoever and was literally treated as merchandise. Beatings and lashings were like free real estate when it came to punishing them for any minor offense. However, when masters really wanted to humiliate them, slaves would be forced to carry a piece of wood around their neck. This was called the furca, letting the world know that the wood-carrying slave had been very, very naughty. A slave caught committing theft, adultery, or forgery could be punished with death by crucifixion. 
But it is worth noting that being merchandise, the slave also had a cost, and therefore the corporal punishment could never be too harsh in order not to permanently impair him unless the circumstances were extremely grave. Roman citizens, on the other hand, were very rarely sentenced to death. By law, a Roman citizen could be condemned to death only if he committed treason or patricide. Furthermore, in all instances, a Roman citizen could not be crucified. Romans were largely punished by monetary fines, confiscation of property, infamy, banishment, and at worst, slavery whenever a fine would not be enough to get them out of their troubles. But it was the capital punishment with which Romans would get real creative. Let's just say they didn't believe in a clean, quick death. Crucifixion is obviously the most popular example of it. But Romans didn't just stop there. Poena Cule, or punishment of the sack, applied mostly to Romans who were found guilty of parricide. The victim was put into a leather sack together with several animals, including a monkey, a snake, a dog, and a rooster. After all of them were put into the sack, it was sewn together and thrown into a river. Needless to say, from there on, it was a struggle of survival to the last among these forced companions. Romans didn't have a weird choking fetish, it was the other way around. Spilling blood inside the ancient city of Rome was considered sacrilege and thus was regarded as taboo. This is why strangulation was the most common method employed for punishment by death. However, it wouldn't be a Roman punishment if it didn't have a flair about it. The condemned would first be paraded all around the city before being brought to the Roman Forum or back to his cell. There, the executioner would simply strangle the convicted felon to death with a rope if he wasn't already dead by embarrassment. After the Great Fire of Rome killed hundreds of people, Emperor Nero accused Christians of starting it. As retribution, Romans had thousands of Christians who were persecuted and subsequently burned alive. However, it didn't just stop there. Christians were burned as early as the 2nd century with a first recorded chronicle of Polycarp, a Christian bishop. Constantine the Great added burning to death as a punishment for multiple other offenses as well, including sexual assault. The convicted were forced to put on a tunica molesta, a papyrus-based outfit that was smeared with wax and was tied to a high pole. Burning pitch and lard were poured from the top which incinerated the helpless victim. Ironically, Christians would later use the same method to burn thousands of women during witch hunts. If you were a soldier in the Roman army, you were the better part of a great group. If your group was considered to be cowardly, decimation was used as a punishment to set things straight. The entire cohort of about 480 men was divided into groups of 10, and every 10th man was to be executed. The word decimation simply means removal of the 10th. So, yes, this was quite literally a permanent removal. The tenth man who had drawn the shortest straw was beaten, clubbed, or stoned to death by the other nine members of his group, while the rest of the cohort watched, awaiting the same fate for them. You shall have a golden crown that men shall tremble to behold. One of the most satisfying scenes of Game of Thrones was to watch Khal Drogo pour molten gold on Viserys' head when he demanded the crown he was promised. The innovative killing scene from George R. R. Martin wasn't exactly the brainchild of his imagination, but a callback to history, Roman history to be more precise. Romans loved to have molten gold or molten lead poured into the mouth of people charged with a death sentence. Surprisingly, this ridiculously horrific method of execution continued at least until the 16th century. The last recorded death by molten gold was suffered by a greedy Spanish governor in the colonial settlement in Ecuador in the year 1599. Now, whether or not he got to keep the gold, well, that's up for debate. According to some historians, Roman Emperor Domitian, who ruled from 81 AD to 96 AD, was apparently so perturbed by the presence of Christians in the Roman Empire that he came up with new methods of punishing them to death. One of his favorite methods was to strip the victim naked and put them inside a barrel that was closed with only their heads sticking out. The victim was then force-fed and smeared with honey and milk to attract insects and parasites to feed upon the victim alive. The barrel was put into the hot sun to attract a swarm of creatures that would feast on the body of the helpless victim. This could go on for multiple weeks until the person inside the barrel died, 
and their body rotted inside it. One of the reasons Romans enjoyed getting creative with death sentences was that it was also a source of entertainment for them. So there is no surprise that they turn execution into a sport as well. And once again, animals got the short end of the stick. One of the most popular execution methods involved the convicted being ripped apart by wild animals, a sentence referred to as damnatio ad bestias. Many Christians suffered this fate as they were sentenced to death for being part of this dangerous new cult. It's estimated that nearly half a million people were killed inside the Roman Colosseum alone, many of those suffering this horrible fate. Damnatio ad bestias was usually programmed between the events of Venaccio and gladiator fights. Venaccio itself was a form of punishment reserved for war prisoners and undisciplined gladiators where they were forced to fight hungry, desperate beasts to death. Venaccio was so popular that it caused the extinction of many predatory animals from Europe. No punishment method is as related to ancient Romans as crucifixion, thanks to the story of Jesus of Nazareth. Crucifixion combined multiple forms of torture, after being nailed to the cross, which is in itself a horrible ordeal to go through. The victim would hang on the cross for multiple days, most probably with dislocated shoulders before eventually suffocating to death. If this took longer, the executioner used a sledgehammer to break the femur bones of the victim, which is one of the most painful experiences a human being can go through, so he would suffocate much faster. This was not an easy way to go by any means. So, which ancient punishment would you vote to avoid? Tell us in the comments. And if you want to learn more about judicial systems and crimes in ancient times, check out our videos about what punishment was like in ancient Greece and ancient Egypt. Thanks for watching Nutty History. Do not forget to smash that like button.